Welcome to 2819. This is the show where we aim to inspire you to become disciples of all nations. I'm Sandra Demez. And I'm Brian Rombacher, and this is a television outreach of Reasons to Believe, a viewer-supported ministry where science and faith converge. And as you're watching, if you want to support resources like this show, visit reasons.org 2819. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. We want you to stay up to date on all the awesome videos we're putting out. And don't forget to connect with us on social media or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 2819show. And if you just want the audio version of 2819, you can check out the podcast. It's on Google Play and Apple Podcasts. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcast. Well, now it's time for a quick rundown of what we're going to have on today's episode. In our Nexus segment, we're going to have Erica Carlson addressing the question, what is the most compelling evidence for God's existence? And in RTB 101, Krista will be talking with Ken Samples, asking, what does it mean to be a Christian? And in Give and Take, Jeff will sit down with one of our scholars to talk about, should Christians use science to defend Christianity? First up, though, we have Culture Talk. Sandra will be interviewing Nick Tavani, our visiting scholar, about what is mixed reality. Let's check that out. Welcome to Culture Talk. This is the segment where we talk about the intersection of faith and pop culture and how culturally relevant topics can help us start conversations about our faith. I'm joined today with Dr. Nick Tavani. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. It's fun to be here. Yeah, you know, and you have kind of a long resume. So you are an RTB visiting scholar, RTB Washington, D.C. chapter president. You have a Ph.D. in biophysics and physiology, and you're also a family practice doctor. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. We're going Thanks. to be talking about something kind of fun. So you recently watched Oculus 5. Yes. Right? You watched a clip from there. I just, it popped up on Facebook and I just I grabbed my attention because I'm not a gamer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I watched what they were saying and it grabbed my attention. I realized what they were saying is not just about games, mm -hmm. but this is about something for our future in the that may change the culture. Right. So they and, were they were talking about augmented reality. We'll start virtual, virtual reality. reality. Yeah, with the goggles. Right. So we're familiar with that. Yeah. I only had one experience with virtual reality a while ago where I uh, you got in this ride and you were mm -hmm. a jet pilot. Mm. And I said, "Oh, it, it's probably just a ride." When I got those on and and it started going, I was a jet pilot. Yeah. And they and all of a sudden they're just, you know, you it's hard to not believe you're there. That's how well they were doing it years ago. Mm -hmm. Now it's even more, I understand, more realistic right. living in this virtual realm. Yeah. So, so we have virtual reality, and we see that in things like Ready Player One and in right. tons of films, but it's also something that is accessible today. Well, and yeah, that, that's what they were talking about, right. the latest things that are coming out. Right. And I'm, I'm not advertising for them, but it's just <laughs> what I happen to see. But yeah, Ready Player One, mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't heard of that movie until I began to talk about this with a patient of mine who never talks. And as soon as I mentioned virtual reality, he starts going on and on about how he has people over his house and they have this virtual reality game. They all play together and they all love it. Yeah. And it opened my eyes to an entire subculture out there that's mm -hmm. growing very big right. of, of gamers, of, of people actually playing in virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I know, you know, people are on their cell phones and on their computers a lot, but this goes beyond that. Right. And um, then I realized that I needed to understand really what effect is this going to have? What, you know, how does this how does this affect our, our entire culture? Right. Because something grabbed my attention in the, in the speech that was uh, that was being given on, in the Oculus uh, video. They want to have one billion people on this platform within the next, I don't know, a year or two after it comes out. And this is the virtual reality? Th this is, or this the... is virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, then there was a speaker. Uh, his name was Boz. He was the second speaker. Um, and you can go on, the, on YouTube and find it to see his whole speech. But what got my attention was that he was he's saying, well, we've been in virtual reality, mm -hmm. and then there's augmented reality. He says, but our real goal is mixed reality. Yeah, so tell us about yes. that. Yes, he goes, this goes beyond gaming. And then he got mm -hmm. serious. He said, this is gonna be a cultural game changer. He says, if you think that cell phones changed us, and believe me, they have. Did, yeah. Flying over here, I looked in the airplane, everyone on the plane <laughs> was, on their, was on their cell phone. But he said, this is all about connectivity. Mm -hmm. And with mixed reality, have you heard of it? Oh before? yeah, so okay. we were talking a little bit about yeah. that too. That's where virtual reality and 
reality come together mm -hmm. so that I could be in Washington, D.C., in my home. You could be right here. And this whole environment would be created with the realism that we have right mm -hmm. now. And the idea is to, to connect people without having them to physically come together. He said that's going to take over business, even to where you know we could use that uh, real estate for buildings for some other purpose, mm -hmm. because businesses will, will use this. Mm -hmm. Schools, people coming together without actually physically coming together. Does it, that Im impress you in some it's, way? It's impressive. It's, it's kind of... Hard to wrap my mind around that, right? But it, it seems well, it like wraps we around see, your mind, right? That's <laughs> true. It seems very much like something we'd see in Black Mirror, or like you talked about um, Ready Player One, yeah. where we're just fully immersed in this altered world. And so I have to ask, as a Christian, how can we begin to even understand that? That's good, you know. And I think we should be thinking of it mm -hmm. in positive terms as a Christian, because usually we're always the ones to beginning to to, to think what you know what what's the bad part of that, right. you know. Um, people to this, a lot of Christians they don't like Facebook, and they say we run our cell phones too much and all that. But there's a positive side of that too. Mm -hmm. So we need to start thinking of how this technology can enhance our ability to spread the gospel and also live Christian lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just beginning to think about that. This is really early on. But already, I know in the newest, um, the newest versions are coming out with is that they have six degrees of, of freedom. So, or six degrees, I think they're called, of freedom. So that you can have reality in all dimensions like mm -hmm. this. And eventually, they, they'll get to where you can touch and feel and all of that mm -hmm. as well. So it's going to be very much there. But the, what I realized as I was watching the games is that the imaginative part went towards things that were not uh, it, it, were not enhancing people's spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. It go, you know, there's the violence and there's the self-centeredness mm -hmm. and there's the immorality, all that. It, it's just stuff that makes for good games. I think we're going to have to to come up and show that there's a better way in 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 the way we behave. Mm -hmm. And also, here's the important thing: we need to show that spiritual reality is real mm -hmm. and different than fantasy. Right. That's going to be the big challenge for a generation who grows up in, in a virtual realm or a mixed reality realm where they can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to somehow be able to tell them that there is a spiritual reality. And what's interesting is sometimes the fantasy world taps into that. I realized that ancient Rome was the same way with their, with their gods and myths and, and all. People lived in another world. And Christianity came into that context and made a difference by bring, proclaiming the truth of the gospel. And I think we're going to have to think of ways how to do that. Right. I think that's a challenge for your generation to yeah. do that. You know, it's a really interesting idea. So I love what you're saying is that, you know, think of some positives and how we can positively engage in this new technology or emerging technology, but then how we can bring truth to something that that's right. Is is imaginary. So we bring the, the truth of our faith and the truth of the gospel. Thank you so much. If you'd like to hear more from Dr. Nick Tavani, visit reasons.org and search Nick Tavani. Next up, we're going to hear a clip from theoretical physicist Erica Carlson, and she's going to answer the question, what is the most compelling evidence for God's existence? Let's check it out. From, from the sciences, to me, the most compelling um, is actually that we're here. <laughs> uh, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? I think that is profound, and, and uh, natural sciences certainly doesn't provide a good explanation for that. Sometimes you'll hear people saying, well, uh, things can fluctuate out of nothing, therefore, but they don't, you know, what they mean by nothing is different from what, you know, philosophers mean by nothing and why is there something rather than nothing at all, right? So the very fact that there is something is uh, extremely telling. I mean, as a theoretical physicist, I write equations down all the time, and I'm hoping that they apply to the physical universe, but just because I can write an equation down does not logically compel that to have a physical insubstantiation, right? Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee that the math I'm writing down all of a sudden, oh, causes something to pop into existence that takes on that math. That's a huge logical leap that I see a lot of atheist writers making that because the laws are logically self-consistent, therefore there must be a physical insubstantiation. Uh, I don't buy that as a line of reasoning. And so the fact that there is something rather than nothing is, is a huge indicator to me that we are created. Now what about non-scientific evidence for uh, God's existence? 
Well, okay, so that can come in many different forms, right? And that's, that gets to be a very personal question. So uh, for me in my life, the way it came up was um, as a young person. So I said I came to Christ uh, when I was about four years old. Um, it was as a result of my Sunday school teacher. So, you know, our, our friends out there who are teaching Sunday school classes to young children who can be kind of squirrely, God bless you, you're doing great work. My Sunday school teacher every week would ask us, uh, if you want to invite Jesus into your heart, pray this prayer with me. So I was saved 52 times that year because I didn't know if it stuck. Um, and that was a real conversion. I mean, the thi so what are the evidence that I had at that time? The evidence I had at that time was not just the stories of Jesus, but the character of his followers, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, children are really attuned to the character of people, especially how they treat children, right? So the stories about Jesus, he loves children. He treats children with dignity, with the dignity that we four-year-olds know that we are due, right? And uh, his followers did the same. I could tell the believers who were teaching me this about Jesus really did also have the same love for children and the same respect for children that Jesus himself had. Whereas other adults wouldn't give you the time of day, they would talk to you as though you weren't in the room, you know, they would refer to you in the third person. Uh, so, so that's the evidence I had at the time was the character of his followers. If you'd like to watch Dr. Erica Carlson's presentation in its entirety, please visit the Reasons to Believe YouTube channel and search for Erica Carlson. And now it's time for RTB 101. And this is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help train you to share your faith with friends and family more effectively. And I've been thinking about the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? Mm. And to discuss that, I asked my friend and colleague, Kenneth Samples, Hi, theologian, Krista. come join me and talk about this very important question, because there's a lot of competing ideas out there in our culture today of what it means to be a Christian. Sure. I always find it's helpful to start with history. Yes. What has that term historically meant? So let's talk about that. I like history too, and the most popular creed of Christianity has deep roots in history, is the Apostles' Creed, and it lays out in a simple, in a summary way, what Christians believe. Uh, it focuses on the Trinity and the person of Christ. So I think the Trin I think the creed is a great way to define the basics of being a Christian. And so that might be new for some of our yes. viewers, they, the idea of a creed. So maybe we should define that term as what is a creed? Yeah, credo in Latin simply means I believe. And so creeds are usually short statements that relay the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, the Apostles' Creed is one of the shorter ones. And it's very ancient. And, and it goes back many centuries. The Nicene Creed is probably even older. The Athanasian Creed is longer and more detailed. But creeds are used in all branches of Christendom. And most Protestant churches have a, one creed or another. So they're kind of a summary yes, of our faith. Exactly. Uh, some churches today, if you go on their website, it might be on their about page where it says their statement of beliefs or something like Sometimes that. Sometimes some non-denominational churches will sing a creed, for example. Okay. So when we think about the Apostles' Creed, walk us through some of the key features of what yeah. it means to be a Christian? Like, what are those core beliefs? So right at the heart, the creed's divided into three paragraphs, if you will. The first one's addressed to the Father, the second one to the Son, the third about the Holy Spirit. So right at the heart of being a Christian is believing that the one God exists as three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the doctrine of the Trinity, three in one, one God in three persons. But the creed focuses is longer on the person of Jesus, uh, that he's come into the world at the incarnation, born of the Virgin Mary, that he is the Son of the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it begins to talk about his life, death, and resurrection, and even future statements about the person of Christ. So there, there is in the middle of the Apostles' Creed kind of a basic summary of of who Jesus was, what he did, and, and, and why it's important. And when I think about the Father, it says that he's the creator. Yes. And when we think about the Holy Spirit, that he's kind of the one who's 
over the church and that's right and working the in regenerator us. yeah that's exactly right and that Jesus is coming again it, to judge the living and the dead these are all yeah. sort of the basic beliefs kind of, of a kind of a systematic theology right there in a short statement so if we want to know what does it mean to be a Christian a creed is a, is a great summary it's not a replacement for that's the right. Bible but I know that some Christians kind of have this aversion to the word creed. Yeah. They'll say, uh, you know, no creed but Christ. And so how do we think about that? Yeah, the, the statement is no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, That's which right. sounds kind of like a creed to me, by the way. <laughs> well, uh, I understand there are people who don't come from liturgical churches or more traditional churches. But what I want to say, Krista, is there are creeds in the Bible. The Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is a, is a Jewish creed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, is a creedal statement. In fact, the shortest, most concise Christian creedal statement is Jesus is Lord. So the New Testament has lots of creedal statements. The apostles uh, weeded them in there as they wrote their apostolic literature. We don't need to be afraid of the creeds. And the historic creeds, if they do anything well, they're faithful in summarizing biblical doctrine. That's very helpful. And so when we're thinking about what does it mean to be a Christian, and I'm talking to my non-Christian friends, I'm sure they're very confused sometimes yeah. with yes. what does it even mean to be a Christian because there's so many competing definitions out there. That's right. How might the creed actually help me in my witnessing efforts? Well, I think it, it gives, first of all, a historical connection. This isn't just Krista's faith or Ken's private faith. This is a historic Christianity. So it takes them back many centuries and anchors it in apostolic teaching. I think it also helps us to realize that the Trinity Believing that God is triune then makes it possible for Jesus to come to the earth in the incarnation, to die on the cross, to be raised from the dead, and in the future to reign, come again and reign. So being a Christian is putting your confident trust, that's the, the Greek word for faith, is confident trust in a reliable source. And that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To be a Christian is to believe in Christ and to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. Very good. And it's to believe in these very important historical elements of our yes. faith. That's first before my experience or, yes. or my testimony, if you will. Very important. Uh, such, that's such good stuff. Thank you, Ken, for You're helping welcome. us sure. think that through. And I want to encourage you, if you'd like to read more from Ken or read his extended blog series on the Apostles' Creed, just go to our website and search for Reflections. Now Ken's going to make his way over to the other set and talk to Jeff about the question, should Christians use science to defend Christianity? Let's check it out. Hello, Jeff Zwerink again, back with Give and Take, the segment of our show where we look at scientific issues and how we can use those to build confidence in the truth of Christianity so that we can share it with others. Today, I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Ken Samples, and we're going to address the question, should Christians use science to defend the Christian faith? Ken, good to have you again here today. Thank you, Jeff. So this is something actually that even before we get into the science has a little bit of controversy, or, or at least it doesn't always sit well with some Christians. The idea that we're defending the faith or not just declaring the truth. So should, is this something that Christians ought to even be involved with, defending the faith, if you will? Well, if you look at the New Testament, there are a number of passages that relate to the apostles either defending the faith or giving instruction to others to defend the faith. Probably the most important is 1 Peter 3.15, which is a mandate to do apologetics. Peter, writing to the church, says, Always be ready to give to every man an answer, a reason for the hope that you have. So uh, if undoubtedly in that time nobody's going to be asking about Big Bang cosmology because uh, of being in the first century, mm -hmm. but if they're asking questions... What if they ask a question about Platonism and Christianity, or they ask a question about, you know, pagan morality? It seems Peter is telling us, be ready to talk about the faith and answer people's appropriate questions. In the 21st century, it's very normal and natural for somebody to ask, yeah, but is Christianity consistent with modern science? So the mm -hmm. answer is yes. So it seems like there's an aspect of apologetics that's just 
equipping you to be involved in the conversations that are going on. People are going to ask questions, and if you don't have answers to the questions, they may not want to engage with anything deeper than you, correct? People are going to ask today about uh, relativistic ethics or same-sex marriage. They're going to ask a variety of questions. We want to be able to engage them about the gospel and how Christianity fares in the public square. In part, what seems like is going on there is that people are asking, is this true? Is this something worth listening to? Yeah. Um, that, to me, I think, is a place where Christianity has a great advantage over every other worldview, is that I think it's the one that's best anchored in the truth. Uh, going all the way back to the apostles, it seems like they're doing that. Uh, yeah, th that's, a, that's a really good point. Uh, people are asking, look, is Christianity true? Does the Christian worldview comport well with what we know about other areas that reasons to believe. We talk about the two books, the book of Scripture, the book of nature. Does Scripture comport mm -hmm. with the book of nature? Uh, for us, it's, you know, Einstein and the Big Bang. For them, it may, may have been Aristotle and Plato. Mm -hmm. So can you give any examples just out of Scripture so that this isn't just us making stuff up to make it feel like we got a good job here? What, are there any examples in Scripture where the apostles are defending the faith, if you will? Oh, yeah. Uh, a number of places. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, Paul goes into the synagogue and uh, on each Sabbath day, he's reasoning with the Jews from the Scriptures to show that Jesus is the Messiah. Then, later in the book of Acts, seven, chapter 17, Paul is talking with the Greek philosophers, quoting their own writers, mm -hmm. talking about the creation of the world. So we see the apostles uh, defending the faith both within Judaism and among the Gentiles. So let, let's kind of take that and turn it to science. I mean, uh, you know, at least for most of my life, if somebody says, well, hey, science says this, people will listen to what there's going on yeah. there. So um, when we're interacting with science, what are some of the issues there that we need to be aware of? And why should we use science to be a part of this defense? Well, I, I, for me, I think that a, a very important part is that Science kind of has a, a privileged status in our time. Mm -hmm. You know, we, th we think that science may be very narrowly focused, but it usually has very credible data and interpretation mm -hmm. of the world. Um, I think people naturally wonder, hey, I can trust science. How does science fit with what you're telling me about the world? And again, if I can relate it back to the Apostles' time, you know, when they talk about creation ex nihilo, partly they were critiquing a platonic interpretation. Mm. When we talk about the universe having a beginning, we might want to contrast it with, you know, a steady state theory or a multiverse showing that our view is, is credible. So I, I think uh, science is a powerful and important enterprise. It has credibility. People naturally want to know, mm -hmm. how does our faith relate to scientific knowledge? Your answer there kind of has two aspects to what we're doing, especially when we're talking about the sciences. One is showing how the latest science actually comports with what the Bible has to say, but then also using that to push on ways that our people are trying to get around Christianity and what they have to say. Am I reading yeah, that correctly? Yes, uh, I, I think we do both of those. I think, I think we want to show that if... If God's the author of the book of, uh, the, you know, the scriptural book, and he's the author of the book of nature, they're going to comport, there's going to be uh, a consensus there. But there are other people, obviously, who come along and say, hey, wait a second, I don't have to buy that interpretation. There is another interpretation. I think we want to be able to enter that discussion and say, no, I think the Christian view has greater explanatory power. So... When we look at science, uh, you know, one, one, one thing as a scientist that I find, and I'm going to throw out a thought for you and get, sure. your, get your assessment of it, is that um, when I read Scripture, I don't get to go in and say, well, I really like John, I like the Proverbs, and I like Revelation, so I'm going to focus on those three. I, I need to read all of it to get God's revelation, if you will. Well, as I understand it, God has revealed himself in creation as well. So if we neglect using science, in some sense, we're missing part of God's revelation. Does that have a part in our defense, our apologetics, if you will? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, people come at life differently. Uh, but in the 21st century, uh, science, technology, 
medicine. These are areas that are very significant. We, we believe the, the enterprise of science leads us to credible knowledge about reality. Um, we're going to come at it from different points of view. You know, some people want to know how does Christianity relate to other religions or mm -hmm. literature or uh, philosophy or things like that. But yeah, we want to bring the various parts of Scripture together, and we want to look at the various parts of the book of nature as well. And science is right at the top of the list, I think, in our age. Well, thanks, Ken. I appreciate your comments. You know, when we look at Christianity, one of the things that separates Christianity from almost every other world religion is that it's based on the truth. And as we go and explore the truth, especially as we look at how God has revealed himself in creation and what science can tell us about how this world works, we develop a great set of tools that equips us to go out and share that truth with the people that God has put around us. I would encourage you to go check out Ken's blog, The Christian Apologetics Mandate, so that you can understand the reason why we want to defend our faith and how we can use that to go share the gospel with those God has put in our path. That does it for us this week on 2019. We hope that you've been encouraged by this episode to really just share your faith and to do so with confidence and compassion. And if you want to support resources like this show, please visit reasons.org 2819. And don't forget, connect with us on social media. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at 2819 show. I haven't been on social media a lot lately, so I want to come back and I'm hoping to see lots of yep. comments. <laughs> see you all next week.